Good morning, CVCC. I uh, have known Pastor Jude for many, many years, and today I see him again. And now that he's sung, I'm here to give you the benediction, then we can go home. <laughs> and also over the years, uh, my good friend Pastor Henry Tan has been telling me about his cousin. This, this guy who he ministers in healing and started a ministry center and all that. I, I never met his cousin. Then <laughs> finally, last year, we spoke on the phone and, and then we met in the office with Pastor Linda as well. And today I'm here. So pa thank you, Pastor Francis, for having me in this morning in this church here. I'm so glad to finally see uh, all of you. I've heard about you for many, many years and I'm here today. And of course, I also know Irvin. Ir Irvin's behind. And I, who, who else? Linda's, Linda's husband and uh, yeah, I think good to know a few familiar faces. Amen. I, I was born in Sabah. Uh, when I was 11 years old, my parents uh, took me to Singapore to study English. So I came here um, before I was 11 actually, and I studied in St. Andrews Primary, and St. Andrews Secondary, and St. Andrews Junior College. So I'm not just a saint, I'm a true blue saint. <laughs> and after Junior College, I went to Australia, did a degree in accounting. My dream was to be a business leader in a multinational corporation. And uh, after university, or in, in uni, I met Dinah. And I wanted to be single, uh, but Dinah kept on praying. <laughs> and you know, the prayer of a righteous woman availeth much. Amen? Amen? You're not convinced. Okay, so I, I think it's still early in the morning. And then we came back from Perth, Australia. We came back here. So I was an accountant. Dinah was a PR consultant. We got married and started a church as a, a full-time professionals. And after four years, the church actually grew. So, uh, so, so I resigned from a full-time accountant, a lay church planter, to become a full-time pastor. Then after seven years, Dinah resigned, and she came full-time as well. So, um, so I used to count money. Now I count sheep. And so after serving as a pastor for 16 years, um, then my denomination, Hope International, asked me to relocate to North America to oversee all our Canadian and our US churches. So I stepped down as senior pastor about seven years ago to apply for a religious visa. And uh, so when I applied for the visa, it was denied. So I was, I was stuck in Singapore. That's when, you know, we were uh, together in the missions arena, Pastor June. Uh, and then so I was waiting for, then I, I, I said, God closed the door, he's going to open a window for me. So I joined a business, uh, a, a mobile IT business in HR to apply for a business visa to enter to North America. And cut long story short, the visa was approved, but by the time it was approved, the company wasn't doing well. So they couldn't send me to North America. So after five years of waiting for two different visas, I was still in Singapore. And, and then um, it was 2014, two years ago, when I was saying, God, it's so confusing. I have never cried so much in my whole life. I've never prayed so much in my whole life. You know, I, I was going through a midlife transition, pastoring a very um, um, fruitful ministry, and stepped out from all of that to go for missions and stuck in Singapore. So I said, Lord, what is happening to my life, you know, and to my family and to my ministry? And the Lord said to me two years ago, Ben, um, I want you to pioneer sexual wholeness in Singapore. And I said, Lord, I'm trained in accounting. I've been a pastor. And in Sabah, we, sp we speak Hakka in Sabah. I don't even know the word sex in Hakka. <laughs> and how do I tell my parents what I do? You know, God, uh, pa pa Papa, Mama, you know, I'm, I'm trained as an accountant, you know, and, and then I've been pastoring all these years. And, and now, what are you doing again? <laughs> so, so it was quite confusing for me. So I, I, was, um, I, I was about to um, go and start a ministry, then focus on a family, heard about it. And they are also very concerned about this area. And they, they came up to me and said, you know, can you start it uh, with focus on the family? And so the Lord was speaking to me that, you know, Ben, the sexual wholeness ministry is going to be very integrated and holistic. And I said, whoa, it's like, uh, the Lord said to me, um, focus on prevention. That means upstream work 
and intervention, downstream work, and focus on straight sex and also gay sex. The entire spectrum, left, right, up and down, entire thing. So when you go and equip churches and coach pastors, upstream, downstream, straight sex, gay sex, the entire thing, so that everyone has the full picture of what sexuality is all about. And so, it, it, so this, it's been two years I've been doing this, and when Pastor Francis asked me to speak here today, so um, this is what I speak about, and in this season, this is what I, I help churches with. So today, I'm going to speak to you about returning to the garden, which is embracing God's design for sexuality. Uh, about 50 years ago, in, in the 60s, something happened in the West called the sexual revolution. And many argued that in the 60s, the sexual revolution would liberate men and women from sexual repression. And, and now people can have sex without the covenant of marriage. And many pointed to the Bible as the source of sexual repression. So in the 60s, they threw away the Bible and had sex without covenant. And this thinking and this lifestyle has reached Singapore. So now we see in Singapore the full consequences of misdirected sexuality. We see teenage pregnancies, we see sexually transmitted infections. We see no-fault divorce, abortion, HIV. And stats don't even cover the psychological damage that children face when parents divorce. You know, the, the tragedy in the church is that our young, our young never hear from us as parents about sex. And uh, that's why I'm glad your church is, is going to equip you through this session about sexuality because our young, when they don't learn from us, they learn from pornography. And they learn from their equally misinformed friends. So your pastors who love you want you to be equipped in this area so you can disciple your children in the area of sexuality. And our young will no longer be misguided. So today, I'm going to take you back to the first garden on earth. And Genesis, which tells us about the garden, in Genesis presents a microcosm of the entire story of humanity. And Genesis also gives us an unblushing approach to human sexuality. Now, how many of you here in CVCC, how many of you here, show of hands, have ever heard a sermon on sex? Raise your hands. How, how many of you? One, two, three, four, five. Five. How many of you here have ever been in a cell group where you discuss sexuality? Cell group. One, two. Okay. How many of you here, your parents have discipled you in sexuality? One. My parents taught me also, just said, don't do it. And then when I got married, they said, do it. <laughs> so, so the wrong messaging is that sex is a switch. That's wrong, you know. Sex is not a switch. And today, we, we're going to come and we're going to go into the Word of God. Before that, let's pray together and commit this time to the Lord. Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we know that every scripture is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness that a man and woman of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good thing. Today, O oh God, we sit under the authority of your word, and we know that one word from heaven can change our lives. And Lord, Sunday after Sunday, we come to service because we want to meet Jesus. And when we meet Jesus, our lives will be transformed. Lord, cause us to go out those doors today, a different human being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Lord, today would you uphold thy servant as he uplifts thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Returning to the garden, embracing God's design for sexuality. Today, we're going to journey together. And, and I know that uh, for many churches where I speak in, it's the first time they've ever heard a sermon on sexuality. 
So if there's anyone here that's below the age of 12, I want to say that this is a PG-rated message. And so if you, if you have a child here, please explain what we can explain to your children. I'm going to explain to you today five intersections where Christianity intersects with sexuality. Five intersections. And the first one, the first intersection where theology intersects with sexuality is the Christian way of thinking about sex. In other words, before we talk about sex, we must talk about the worldview on sex. How do we see sex? Before we talk about marital, about sexuality in general, we must talk about the worldview. How do we even think and see sex? And uh, so here, I'm going to share with you the Christian way of thinking about sex. The Christian worldview about sex. Because if you don't get this, you won't understand LGBT. You won't understand marital sexuality. You won't understand gender. You won't understand premarital sex. If you don't understand the worldview of sex, you won't understand sex. And that's why our young people are also misguided because we don't have the worldview of sexuality. So what is the Christian worldview on sex? What is the Christian way of thinking about sex? Now, I'm going to share with you some principles here, which is foundational. I normally spend two full days training pastors and elders about sexuality. Today, I'll try and do it within one hour. By God's... So today's going to be a miracle, okay? So the first principle in a Christian worldview on sex is that each human being is created in God's image. In Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 27, God created mankind in His own image. And that emphasis, in the image of God, He created them. Here, God created the human person for a very special purpose. That means the human being, the human body, has a purpose. And when, when we realize that, we realize that the human body is sacred. It is designed for a very specific purpose. And the human person, the human body, is created as an eternal vessel to declare the glories and the mysteries of God. So you and I are an image bearer of Almighty God. That's why each person, each human being, whether you're a CEO, whether you're an employee, whether you're a domestic worker, every person has intrinsic value. You have intrinsic worth. That's why abortion is always wrong. That's why euthanasia is wrong. Because the body has purpose. We are not like an animal. We're not like any other creature that when it wants to eat, it just kill another person and eat. We are not an animal that when we are in heat, we just jump on another human being and have sex. We're a person created in the image of the Most High God. And so the human being is a sacred person. Our body has purpose. The second way of looking at sexuality is that God created, this is a very important principle here. If you don't get this, then you won't understand about gender confusion and, and those kind of things. So God created one humanity in two distinct genders, which we call the male and the female persons. And in the second part of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in the image of God, He created them. It goes on male and female. So there's a binary here. Male and female, He created them. So God created one humanity in two genders, the male and the female. So why is this critical to understand sex? Because the model for humanity is divinity. God is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. One divinity, three persons. 
humanity is one human nature, two persons. So in other words, God created the male and the female in order to lead us into a greater spiritual reality in that this male and the female reflects the Trinity. Two in one, three in one. And in other words, it takes the male and the female to reflect God. What, what does this mean? I mean, that, that's all theology, but what does it mean in, in practical? In other words, it means the divine image is reflected in marriage. Now, for those of you who are singles, listen carefully. Now, I, I will talk about singlehood another time, how singles reflect the glory of God. But the, the man and the woman in marriage reflects the Trinity. This is how it works. For example, the theology of agape love, which is unconditional love, which is unconditional love and, and unmerited favour. So, Grace, so to, to a young child, they, they say, Dad, what is agape? What is unconditional love? They don't understand because children don't know abstract concepts. But when the kid sees the dad and the mom loving each other, forgiving each other, washing each other's feet, saying sorry to each other, exhibiting tenderness and care to each other, to the domestic helper, to the children, to the everyone around them, then the kid realizes that that is agape love. Live down in the father and the mother. And they understand what is God's nature to the parents. That's why parenting is discipleship. It's so critical to understand. So even in this, the transcendent image of God is reflected in the male and in the female in marriage. And again, singles reflect God in a different way. And that's another sermon, not for today. But today, we want to mention that God created one humanity, the male and the female, and this reflects the Trinity. And so this is crucial to understanding gender and sex and everything else. The, the third uh, principle of a Christian thinking about sex is that God gives sexual intimacy as a gift to strengthen a marriage relationship. So the scripture tells us in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 24, a man leaves his dad and mom and then he cleaves or he unites with his wife and then they become one flesh. You see the word one is there. So the husband and the wife, one. Two becomes one. And, and here, the, the, the theology of one comes in again. So two becomes one just as three becomes one in the Trinity. So the, the Godhead is three in one and the marriage is two in one. And once again, so the, the, the Bible message is united. So they, they become one. So in other words, sex cleaving is becoming one. Sex is giving my entire humanity to another person. That's why marriage is so sacred. Because the woman is giving the most sacred thing to a husband, which is her life. Sex is a very deep thing. Sex is a threefold union, body, soul, and spirit between a man and a woman. Sex is so powerful, it is only safe within a one specific relationship called marriage. It is so powerful, it's only safe in this one relationship. So there's no such thing as casual sex. That is an oxymoron. So the goal of marriage is oneness. Two becomes one, just like the Trinity is one. That's the goal of marriage. So what the husband and the wife does in sexual intercourse 
is to unite across the male and female divide to unite. And unless they unite, the culture cannot survive. So you see, the body is sacred. Marriage is sacred. And sex is sacred. The, the sexual union that binds the husband and the wife becomes one of worship unto God. So when the husband makes love to his wife in the marital bed, that is an act of worship. Because our whole lives, our body is a living sacrifice. And when the husband and the wife makes love, he or, and she renews their marital covenant. And God is pleased because they are functioning uh, in a marital bed what God has designed marriage and sex to become. And that's why the body, marriage and sex is so sacred. And that's why the union, uh, including sexual union between the wife and the husband, is a rich metaphor to describe our union with God. How God comes in and He invades our inner sanctum, that, that oneness with Him, that oneness with, with, with the Trinity, and the oneness with our wife is, is rich, is powerful, and not to be trifled with. God didn't make us human beings and give us sex so that we can be sexually fulfilled, which is what the world tells us. God gives us sex to strengthen one specific relationship called marriage. If you don't get this, you won't get sex. If you don't get this, you won't get gender. The fourth thing I want to share with you today on the worldview on sexuality or the Christian thinking about sex is that God himself incarnated. That means Emmanuel, God with us. God came in the flesh. The eternal word became the living word. So the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We, this is people in the early church, I mean, they, they saw His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father. So God came as a human being. So the body is sacred, right? Because God came and became a man. He became a human being. So the body, which, is, which has an expression for sexuality, which has sexual desires and all that, also is a place of divine revelation. That's why human sexuality must never be thought as genital intercourse alone. Because the human body is a place where the divine finds human expression. Where God came down. And th this brings me nicely. This brings me to my fifth and final point on Christian worldview and sect. Is that our body is a temple. So God incarnated it was 2,000 years ago. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and, and this, this passage here is a passage telling us that sex is actually supernatural. But I will not go into that today, but suffice to say that you see here, our body is a temple. The world tells us our body is an amusement park. It's to play. But the Word tells us our body is sacred. In fact, our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So, 
Paul asks rhetorically, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Oneness. Oneness. Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. People say, it's my body. I can do whatever with my body. Is it really your body? You're not your own. The Bible says. This is not my theory, by the way. It's not my uh, preference or whatever. You're not your own. I'm not my own. Listen to what the word says. And you were bought at a price. People, people dress, you know. They act like their, their body is cheap, you know. They sleep around. You are not cheap. You are so expensive. Jesus went to the slave market of sin. He gave us everything. When there was nothing else to give us, He gave us the one thing He had left, which is His life. So don't live like you are cheap. Don't act and don't talk like you are cheap. Your body is sacred. And your life was purchased. As we remember earlier on, through his life. The Christian should have a very high regard for the human body. The Christian should regard the body as sacred because God views the body as sacred. The Christian has a high view of sex, that it is beautiful and it is powerful. Because God has a high view of sex. It is sacred. And marriage is sacred. Uh, it's very serious right now. <laughs> could, could you smile a bit? Yeah. Did you know that it's illegal to smile in church? Did, did you know that? Did you, did you know that? Okay, it's legal. We, we have a lawyer here. Uh, it's legal to, to... Number two, the second thing, I want to now zoom in on what is sexuality. Let's now, now that you, you and I have the right concept, the right worldview, the right way of thinking about sexuality. Let's talk about sexuality right now. And, and let's talk about sexuality and sexual wholeness. Now, now sexuality, this is important once again. You need to get this, you know, or else you'll always be living in shame or in guilt and your marriage will be in, in kind of difficulty and, and so forth. And sex has two concepts, intention. And uh, so sexuality has, has the sensual and the affectionate. Now l- listen carefully, the sensual and the affectionate. In other words, in sexuality, there's the aspect of the hormones and the intercourse. There's also the aspect of affection, the oneness, the emotional oneness. So the biological urges and the emotional, the friendships and all that are two paths of sexuality. So the biological and the social, the two halves. And as a Christian, we need to integrate the sensual, and the affectionate. Now, now, what what does that mean? Now, that means that as a human being, we are also a sexual being. That means that we have sexual desires because of this, um, the sensual. We have sexual desires. So, in in other words, as human being, you would have a sexual drive. And that is not a bad thing. That is a normal and a natural appetite. Now, don't confuse sexual desire with lust. Two different things. What's the difference? Okay, simple illustration. Those of you who are like me have something called hunger. Hunger is a normal and a natural appetite. But hunger and overeating are two different things. Amen? Amen? You all don't know what overeating is, right? You're, okay, it's a very good church. 
So hunger and natural appetite doesn't need to lead us to overeating or other eating disorders like bulimia, anorexia and all that. So sexual desire in and of itself does is not sin. It doesn't have to lead us into sin as well. But when it becomes lust, then it's a problem. Right? So this is very important to understand. The next thing about sexuality, it's not just about sensual and affectionate. Sexuality is also our basic identity as male or as female. So in other words, a person is born as male or as female. And this is very important, and I, I'm going to go into this a, a bit more later on under sexual wholeness, um, but this is not, as male and female, it's not just what is between our legs. It's a lot more than that because we are a, a human being and not just a biological being. And so let me explain to you now about sexual wholeness to give you a fuller understanding so that you will live right and be whole. What is sexual wholeness? What, what does that mean? Sexual wholeness means that we need to look at a, at a person holistically. Holistically. So, so in other words, the Bible says that the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He followed, he followed you. And then, so there is a sequence and then he breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Then a third thing that happened, the man became a living being. Three things happening here. First, God created the man from the, the dust. So there was a man. And then God breathed life into this man. And third thing, the man became a living being. So in other words, Adam was a man before he was a living being. And that means that Adam's ma maleness or manhood is in every part of him, body, soul, and spirit. What, what does that mean? That means that Adam or every man here thinks like a man, feels like a man, prays like a man, connects with God and with others as a man. That means a woman is every part a woman. Thinks like a woman, feels like a woman, prays like a woman, every aspect like a woman. Even shops like a woman also. <laughs> so in other words, if we think that by going for gender reassignment surgery, we become the opposite gender, you are fooling yourself. Because in every aspect of our life, we are a man or woman, changing what's between the legs is one aspect of it only. This, this is very important to understand. If you don't get this, it's very hard to talk about. This is a 101 sermon. If you don't get this, then it's very hard to understand LGBT and all the other aspects, okay? And then the other thing about sexual wholeness is that it is relational intimacy. So the Lord, the Lord said that it is not good. I mean, can you imagine? Adam got God. Adam was in the garden. There was no taxes. There was no fines. There was no COE. No, nothing like that. Adam was, had God and everything was pure. And God said, it is not good. And then because you know why? Because we are created as a relational being. We need to connect. When we were born, the baby needs to be touched and kiss and cuddle and tickle and, and all of us need healthy touch and, and love. And You see, let me, let me say this clearly. Yeah. You and I can live without sex, but we cannot live without intimacy. I'll say it again. It's a very important point. If you're doing notes, you can write this down, okay? You and I can live without sex, but you and I cannot live without intimacy. And that's why in prison, 
when you put a person in solitary confinement for too long, the person comes out mentally sick. So torture is one thing, you know, but when you put a person in a small room by himself or by herself for too long, the person comes out, has major mental health problems. Because the human being is not created to be by himself or herself. And, and this part is not just about marriage. It's about the person is a relational being. We, we want to love. We want to be loved. We need to care. We need to be cared for. We need to talk and to be talked with as well. Very important point. And number three is that sexual integrity. Um, uh, click again. Somebody in the back, click. Yeah, okay, yeah. And click, yeah. So early on, I, I spoke about Romans 12 once. So, brothers, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So, your whole life is an act of worship. So, sexual wholeness is having sexual integrity. That means we don't say one thing on Sunday morning and then we act another way six days a week. That means we don't wayang on Sunday with somebody else six days of the week. So sexual integrity is thinking, speaking, living and speaking with consistency. That is consistent with scriptural teaching and with the highest standards of a follower of Jesus. What does that all mean? Um, the best example is Joseph in Genesis 29. Joseph lived with sexual integrity when Mrs. Potiphar came and offered herself to him. He didn't pay for sex, you know. He didn't tempt her. He didn't seduce her. She offered FOC to him. In Singapore, it would look like this. You go on a business trip, all expense paid business trip, hotel paid for, meals paid for, airfare paid for, business class some more. You go in, you check into the hotel room, the bed is so nice, fluffy, mattress, blanket, pillow, all white, even got one orchid petal on the bed. And you look in the washroom, the walls are all glass. And the shower is from the top, like, like this one. It's like a palace. You, 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 you go off for a meeting, come back, and in the evening, they change the flower now. They've got chocolates on the bed now. And then you go for all expense paid dinner. Even alcohol is served. You, you eat, wow, the best food, business. And then you drink a bit of alcohol. A bit tipsy, not tipsy, but kind of like, oh, oh. And then your colleague comes up to you and says, hey, you know, you're an adult, I'm an adult. Let's have a bit of fun tonight. No one needs to know. We're all adults here. Hotel rooms are paid for already. Let's have some fun tonight. No one needs to know, you know. Then Joseph says, Mrs. Potiphar, how can I dishonor you? You don't know God, but I cannot dishonor you. Mrs. Potiphar, how can I dishonor your husband? Mrs. Potiphar, how can I dishonor the name of God whom I represent? Mrs. Potiphar, how can I dishonor my family, my parents, my grandparents, my pastors, my leaders, my cell members? And how can I dishonor my own body? which is sacred. This is an evil thing. It's an evil idea. So Joseph has sexual integrity. He doesn't say one thing on Sunday morning and then something else other times of the week or even overseas. He walks and lives with sexual integrity. I want to share with you also how I, I explain sex to pastors how I explain sex to church members and leaders, I use the garden as a metaphor. I use the garden as an illustration to talk about sex and so that people understand sex and can explain to their children about sex. So scriptures, 
begin with a garden in Eden, and and then it ends with a garden in also in, in Revelations, the garden, the, the river of life. So the garden in the front, garden in the end, and then there's, there's there's a bride and a groom in the front, Adam and Eve, and there's also the bridegroom, and the bride in the, in the end, and 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 in the middle there's also the garden in Song of Solomon, where Solomon and a Shulamite are so unashamed with their affections for each other. So we see this. So the garden in Eden gives us a, a template, a metaphor, a picture to, to think about sex and to explain sex. Now, what, what does that mean? It means that in Jesus, Jesus in Matthew 19, uh, if you click again, um, even Jesus when he talks about sex and marriage and all that, and, and in this case, remarriage and divorce, he goes back to the garden again. So, it's a principle of first mention. Now, male, female, marriage and sex is mentioned first in Genesis. So, Jesus, the Lord himself, goes back to the garden template. And then, then we see Apostle Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians 6 again, where he talks about sex is supernatural. Again, he says, how can you have sex with a prostitute? You are becoming one, the oneness, with a prostitute. And you're dragging Jesus, Holy Spirit, was in you, into that, that union, illicit union. How can you do that? Then he says that, for it is said. Once again, Paul quotes the garden template again. The two become one. He quotes Genesis, word for word. One flesh. So you see here is that, the Bible provides pictures of this garden and the Lord goes back to it, Paul goes back to it and this garden, and when you use garden, talk about sexuality, this garden is not a public garden. It's a private garden. It is a walled garden. There are walls around the garden and we see this throughout the Bible and uh, so we, we see that so think of sexuality as a garden. And there are walls around this garden. Inside the garden, there are trees, there are butterflies, there are flowers, there, there's a river of life. But a wall surrounds the garden. We may, we may wander up to the, to the wall, but we cannot reach the wall. You see, we have a key to the wall in this garden. And we are wondering, do we open the gate and let people in? Because we get tempted, right? There's, there's that sexual desire, right? But it's a wall garden. And we are making a decision. Because outside the garden, there's wilderness. There are weeds of myth, misunderstanding and abuse that fills the ditches around the garden. Outside the garden, I mean. So outsiders, intruders and pests want to come in and destroy the harvest of sexual wholeness. A serpent is outside. The serpent wants to come in and drop his poison and destroy the harvest of sexual wholeness. This is critical to understand. But the walls protect the garden. Now, what happens in the church or in the Christian when the person comes out of the garden, opens the door and comes out? Two things happen. Remember, sex is sensual and affectionate. When we do pornography, when we do masturbation, when we do premarital sex, extramarital sex, all these kinds of stuff, what happens? Two things happen. One, we get physical problems, unplanned pregnancies, that is abortions, sexually transmitted infections. So that's the, 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 the biological, physical side. There's also the emotional side. Then we say, Pastor, he used my body for sex. I feel depressed now. I want to commit suicide. So we have emotional problems. 
and then if you have sex before marriage, get married, the wife will never respect you because you use me. We had sex before marriage. You, you use me. You touch me. There's always that guilt. The marriage is meant to be beautiful. But all the things happening before marriage, the marriage is meant to be beautiful. You drag all the garbage into the marriage. There's the emotional problems. See, sex is multidimensional. And when we cross the boundaries, there are consequences, both physical side and the emotional side. Now, um, just quickly today, I, I'm going to share with you my, uh, the strategy that, that I use. I, I, I don't do it um, in detail with churches, but just to give you a foretaste, uh, I train leaders in this strategy, and so maybe just to give you a, like what would we do so, so you understand a little bit. Number four, um, the fourth point, yeah. So, so this, the sacred garden is what I do to train leaders and pastors go back and train parents how to disciple children on sex. So this garden is a three-layered garden. This is a strategy to nurture sexual wholeness in the family and in the church. Right? So it's a three-layered garden. And so the walls, there are four walls that protect the garden. The life in the garden, which is sexual wholeness. And so the, the, these four walls are how you apply the principles of sexual health. And then there are seven things the parents or the pastors need to do. Seven things. We call them the organic nurseries. Alright? Seven things. So the, these are the, the nurseries here. And the heart of the garden, the wellspring or the river of life, the wellspring is, is, this, is healthy relationships. Because love is required for human flourishing. Without love, we search for it in all the wrong places. So I will not go in, in depth today because this is a, I normally tra train um, leaders and pastors in this. Okay, so I'm going to move on to, to the next slide. So just wh wh what this is, is that this is a structure or a strategy to organize thinking. So the pastors or the parents, okay, have I seven things? Have I done all seven or not? Have I covered all the bases or not? Or else my kid, my, my spouse will stray or whatever, that kind of stuff. And, and then, then the goal is to build sexually healthy disciples. You cannot be spiritually healthy if you're sexually unhealthy. You can cry all you want during worship. You can fall down, shake, laugh, cry, whatever. Every Sunday also for one year, also can. But you cannot be spiritually healthy if you're sexually unhealthy. I challenge you that. And this structure, uh, the, Lord, the Lord downloaded to us, and, and, and so it, it covers prevention, intervention, straight sex, against the entire thing. So, and it's so powerful, it applies to both the home and the church as well. So, th so it's a very comprehensive model and strategy to develop sexually healthy disciples in the home and in the church. I, I think that's uh, me enough for now. The next, oh, okay, right, right. So there's, I think, three, three points here. Yep, okay. That's three points become three blanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's okay, good effects, so. though. So hedges protect the garden. Nurseries uh, represents what the gardener needs to do in a garden. And the heart of the garden is good relationships. In other words, healthy marriages in CVCC. You know what is marriage? Ephesians 5 tells us marriage is private discipleship, where the husband sanctifies or disciples his wife with the washing of the word. Parenting is discipleship. Deuteronomy chapter 6, where the parents disciple the children as the church trains them to do so. So, so, that, that is, uh, so the heart is, is relationships. I want to move on to my final point um, today, which is um, what do we do in our family or in our church when something happens? That means intervene, that means it's got a problem. What do we do now? Likewise, the garden is broken. In some marriage, sexually, like, you know, ma family. What, what, what do we do now? Husband got affair, son caught pornography. What, what, what do we do when that happens? So, everywhere I speak 
in any church that I go to, there are between 50 to 75% of all Christians are facing some kind of a sexuality issue. Everywhere I go, uh, husbands would tell me, Pastor, you know, I wish I could talk to my wife about having more sex. Most men, but don't know how to talk, talk to my wife. Then a lot of wife tell me, Pastor, a lot of sex already in my marriage. I mean, we can laugh now, but for those couples, it's not funny, you know. Yeah. And then some couple says, Pastor, eight years, infertility, nine years. I went for healing. I went for prophecy. I got slain in the spirit, you know, with a blanket, everything also, you know, and still infertile. And then uh, when I was pastoring, I remember this cell leader coming up to my office with a girl. She was sexually molested by her stepfather. And we took her to the police station, you know, to report against the stepfather. So the sexual abuse in the church. And then the other day, I was in the office. This pastor comes and sees me with a church member. HIV. All Christians, you know, sleeping around with strangers in toilets. Having sex, I mean. And pastor, I use condom, you know. Still got HIV. You think condom is safer? Uh? I mean, it's safer. You know why it's safe? Abstinence. So, STI, then, then we have people with uh, premarital sex. T today, we see courting couples go on holidays together. How is that possible? Why are Christian courting couples going on holidays together? Why are they going overseas for the pre uh, wedding bridal photo shoot together and sleep in the honeymoon suite. Why is that going on? Their pornography is epidemic levels in churches today. Every church I go to, epidemic. No one talks about it, but it's epidemic. Uh, there was this gardener in the Bible, in Solomon, King, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 6. This gardener, didn't take care of his own garden. He was doing something else, you know, or this, this is his gardener. Maybe taking care of ministry or some other people's garden or some people, people's family or maybe his career, maybe he's doing MBA or Master's of Counseling or something else, but his own garden was in disrepair. And this is what I see all the time uh, in marriages and all that. Some of you here may be having some sexual brokenness in your life. Some of you here may be trapped in some compulsive sexual behavior, whether you're single or you're married. And I want to encourage you that God has not forgotten you. You must not condone sin. But you must realize that in case you feel condemned, that God has more love in His heart that we have sin in our lives. And you and I need to repent from that darkness and come back into His light. Now, for uh, when I was growing up, for over 10 years, I was an addict to pornography and to masturbation. When I was growing up, um, I was addict. I was not struggling, by the way. I was an addict. It means I was on it all the time. I'm not proud of this. I'm ashamed of this. And I share this publicly because I don't want anybody, I wouldn't wish this on anybody to be an addict, to be trapped in sexual sin. With all that shame. People will ask me, you know, for over 10 years you were an addict, you were a slave. Yeah. By the time I did it, I felt dirty, I felt shameful, I felt dark, I felt evil. And I said, God, I'm so sorry, I won't tell anyone, but I won't do it again. Three days later, I got the urge, do it again. I felt dirty. Suddenly, eh, over 10 years already. People ask me, how did you get out? I tell them, I told somebody. See, when, when there's darkness, sexual sin thrives in darkness. But once you let the light in, 
darkness has to flee. And so today, I'm praying that those of you here who are trapped in all kinds of brokenness and sin, I pray the Holy Ghost will give you a name in your heart right now. Someone from this church that you trust and respect, a leader, pastor, and that you can talk to the person and ask the person to journey with you out of this place. I want to challenge you, don't keep it to yourself. The devils may be speaking to you right now, you know, don't tell anybody. You, you can do it yourself. It's very shameful. But confess one another to one another your sins and they will help you. Ask the Lord to, to give you a name or someone that you trust and that person will help you. A safe and trustworthy person, you are not meant to journey on this alone. I want, to avoid, I want to encourage you with this scripture in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 9. Where the river flows, everything will live. There's some parts of your heart right now that's dying or parched in disrepair. But when the river flows, everything else will live. In closing, I want to challenge every person here, every single and every married to nurture your garden, to nurture sexual wholeness in your garden. I want to challenge you that the sexual desire you feel to connect is to connect with God and to others in intimate relationships. Whenever singles tell me, Pastor, I, I fell again in porn, and I say, why? Because a Pastor, I was lonely, I was stressed, I was bored. Tell them that if you're bored, if you're stressed, you're lonely, you masturbate. How does it help you? You feel good for a moment, but it doesn't help you. Solve the loneliness issue. That's the underlying thing we want to connect. We want intimacy. We want a healthy touch. We want close, covenant friends. That we can tell them that, hey, you know, I'm 37, I'm still single. No one's asking me out. I'm so disappointed with life. You have close friends you can share with, cry together, pray together. I want to challenge you that. And um, ne next slide, please. Um, just, just show all three together, all the three points. Each one of us have a hunger for clean water, organic food, fresh air, and healthy sexuality. All of us want to live healthy. But sin corrupts our lives. On the most basic level, we have longing for intimacy, for comfort, nurturing, and love. When we don't have these things, then we find replicas, we find counterfeits, alcohol, party drugs, gang fights, gangs, sex, what, video games. But this is what we need. We are created to connect with each other. And as a covenant community, not why young community, we got to help one another to walk together and journey together. Let no one in this church be so lonely. They come here, they look spiritual, but they're so lonely, they go to Geylang in the afternoon. But here it's just to pretend, to act religious. Let this church be a genuine community, not just an event on a certain Sunday morning of the week, but a genuine covenant community where we love each other outrageously and are loved outrageously back as well. Amen. Can we just close in prayer? Would you close your eyes with me? Would you bow your heads? I think the worship team can remain where you are. It's okay. Uh, let, let, let's close in our eyes and or would you close your eyes, bow your heads, but open your hearts. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus swam against the tide. When people in his culture all got married, Jesus remained single. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus, that he was not pressured by culture, 
and, and, and pe people back then, some of them, many of them, they got married for children and they have mistresses for sex. Jesus was not only single, but he was abstinent as well. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus because he developed the, the affectionate side of his sexuality. He had deep, nurturing, and French, uh, good friendships with men and women. With Lazarus, with Mary, Martha, and the 12 guys, and, and all those around him, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that he has such a good community of intimate and authentic friends. He could bear his heart even on Gethsemane. Lord, that, that where he was praying and, and he could bring the three guys with him, Lord, his, his close buddies. And Lord, would you meet the deepest needs of our heart, Lord? And today, as all eyes are closed, all heads are bowed, I would like to give uh, an invitation uh, for those of you here who say, Lord, I need to look after the garden of my sexuality. Whether you're single or whether you're married, and, and, you, and the Lord has spoken to you that you need to nurture sexual wholeness in your life. As all eyes are closed, all it's about, you say, Lord, that's me. I want to nurture wholeness in my sexuality. Just raise your hands and put it down. Hands up and down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just hands up and down. Thank you. Yes. Hands up. A anyone else? Okay, there's seven, nine hands, ten hands. Lord, we also come before you and we want to pray for people here in the midst of our, our congregation here who are struggling with an issue. And Lord, um, we want to pray for them as well. If today you are struggling with an issue in sexuality, whatever it might be, and you say, Lord, would you help me overcome this? Would you raise your hands as well and, and then put it down so I can see who you are and pray for you? Hands up and down. Anyone here? So that's me. Hands up and down. Anyone here? You say, yes, that's me. Okay. All right. Would you stand together, please? Stand together, please. Stand together. Would you raise both your hands to heavens? This is surrender. Father, we pray for every man and woman and every child that's standing here. Lord, our hands are lifted and raised in surrender. Lord, you are our mighty God and we call you Father, we call you friend. Lord, would you come in the way that only you can come. Invade our inner sanctum. Make us one with you. Move us, Lord, from the shallow end of the pool to the deep end of the pool. We need you, Lord. How we need you, Lord. We, we pray for every single person here. Father, uh, for every single person here, Lord, I pray for a framework in their lives that they can manage their sexual energy young singles and older singles. Lord, that, that their sexual urges and desires, Lord, can actually cause them to trust in you, can cause them to uh, turn to others in healthy relationships to meet the underlying needs of intimacy, love, and affection. I pray for every married couple here, Lord, that their marital garden would be healthy, Lord, would you bless every marriage in this church that every marriage can be sexually whole and pure and beautiful and be secure for their children where the husband and the wife are discipling each other in the word and discipling their children in this church, Lord. Where this church is a sexually whole community where a dark world, Lord, can find refuge and sanctuary in CBCC, Lord. We bless every single leader, pastor, member, parent, child, single here, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. All of us say, Amen. Amen. Pastor Linda.